Uh, welcome everyone to the teaching and learning call um, on uh, Wednesday, August 12th. Uh, it's the Aperio and Sakai teaching and learning call. I pasted the uh, Confluence page where we keep um, all of our you know, structure for meeting notes as well as the Etherpad. And I see a lot of people have signed up on the Etherpad. I can repost that just to make sure. Um, the agenda is um, we're following our usual process, uh, welcome and meeting launch, project updates and announcements. There's two jury of the weeks that were just, um, uh, offered up for this week and I think we might be able to cover both of them and then Jerry Timbrook from the University of Dayton is going to cover the e-learning fellows program and we're going to discuss future meetings and just so you're aware I'll mention it a couple times, the next two weeks are canceled to give you all you know more time to work on your back to school issues. I know that you're typically always busy, but during those periods of time, um, you know, that this period of time is particularly uh, particularly busy. So um, I'll just start with a couple of project updates that I'm aware of. Um, and one of them is that uh, I just heard back from the Gradebook NG team and heard the exciting news that uh, they're anticipating uh, getting their commits in to trunk and uh, by the end of next week. Uh, so that's really exciting. Uh, I don't know if you all know what that means. If you have any questions as I use technical terminology, feel free to ask. Um, and then I think once we get the um, lessons tool, once we get, I'm sorry, the Gradebook NG tool uh, in trunk, then uh, we'll want to have that discussion on the, on the community about when to what we call branching Sakai 11. And then we can start thinking about um, you know, the QA effort involved and bug fixing effort involved and what a realistic schedule will be. So that's really exciting. Um, there's also been some, some work I've noticed going on in lessons. Um, I don't know that, I don't think it's the LEAP project per se, but hopefully um, it sounds like it might be inspired by the LEAP and the communications that started to generate from the LEAP project for, um, I think doing multi columns in lessons and I believe that's targeted for 11. So that's kind of exciting development as well. Um, so I don't know if there's, are there any other project updates or announcements or clarifications? And I see Louisa Lee wrote, Charles Hedrick has been working on lessons, although it is not complete yet. I encourage you to take a look in trunk. Multi-column, multiple column will be in. Yeah, that's really cool. Thanks, Louisa. That's, that's pretty exciting. And obviously it's going to take a huge QA, QA, QA effort on lessons. So we will need a lot of QA resources. We'll have a ton of QA to do. Uh, with Gradebook, the integration with Gradebook with all the tools, the lessons, and the integration with lessons and all the tools. Oh, sorry, Rory. Uh, sounds like you got something going on there. I hope that's uh, just a test of the fire alarm there at Texas State and not a real the real thing. Um, any other uh, project updates? Going once, going twice. Okay, so um, if you think of anything, please let us know as we move down the list here. So the next thing are JIRA or of the week or JIRAs of the week, and we'll start with um, Samago 1947, which was suggested by Dave Eveland. Uh, and it's email notification on quizzes. Dave, are you here? I don't see Dave here. Hmm. Jerry, you have good news on this one? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, actually this ticket um, we grabbed here at the University of Dayton and it's almost done right now. So um, it's being worked on in our current sprint and I just IM'd our programmer who's working on it. And he said it'll be done for nine very, very shortly by the end of the week, hopefully. And then he's going to spend a little bit of time porting it to 11, so it'll also be available for that as well. Wow, that's great. Thank you. That's an awesome update. So um, if you guys have any questions about that, feel free to shoot me an email. And uh, I think Leonardo, our programmer, uh, just because I yelled at him, took over the ticket on, uh, yep, he did, um, on JIRA. So he's put that into um, the main JIRA and a link to our JIRA, I think. So you guys should have that out there soon. That's, that's terrific. Thank you. 
Um, so that's great. Let's see. Let's see what happens in the next one. Maybe we'll be as, be lucky on the next one too. Will um, it be ready for two point ten? So we're um, on nine right now, and we're skipping over ten entirely. But we are going to port it to eleven, so it could be backported to ten. Um, I would have to talk to our programmer to see if he, if that's in his uh, building plan as well. Are, are there a lot of folks out there who would need it for ten? Um. I know Dave would be concerned about 10 because that's what we're using at LAMP. And so, yeah. Perfect. Thank you for the perspective there, Terry. I will put that in our local JIRA to let him know that he uh, has another version to worry about, too. <laughs> Glad I could help. Any other questions? OK, cool. So the next one. Uh, is SAK25990, and this one is um, assignments. Student with no previous submission cannot use resubmit. And uh, the way that this uh, manifests, what this, what this does is when you, as an instructor, if, if you're a student and you submit an assignment and the instructor says you're allowed to resubmit past the due date, you can do that. But if you're a student and you did not submit an initial uh, assignment and then the uh, instructor allows you to resubmit. It does, the system does not allow you to resubmit. That's my summary of what I think this issue is. Um, so I'm thinking that is really a bug and not the way it's supposed to behave. Apparently it worked uh, differently in 2.8 but starting with 2.9 and still in 10 and still in 11 um, if you are a student who did not submit um, the have any previous submissions, the instructor is not allowed to, uh, cannot enable you to, resub to submit after the due date. I hope that makes sense. So Terry writes, uh, mostly involves a date change in the settings. Oh, you're working on that one too, Jerry? Oh, okay. I, I don't know how you picked two that we're working on in our current sprint, but yeah, I just looked at our um, swim lane and it is in there. Let me see where it is. Um, okay. Um, actually, it's awaiting QA, so apparently it's done and just looking for us to get in there and mess with it. So let me just read the comments in here. Uh, individual students resubmission date to override the accept until date for that particular student. So I think that speaks directly to the ticket you guys are talking about right now. Well, okay. That's terrific. I mean, you might Thanks. as well just throw a third one in there and see if yeah. we can get <laughs> yeah. on board, too. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm looking through the comments, and I, I don't see plans to throw that one to um, 11, but I'll, I'll go ahead and make sure that since you guys are interested in this, that we do 10 and 11 for that as well. Okay, cool. That's kind of why I brought it up, just to make sure. It seemed to me like a no-brainer, like because if you're the instructor and you want to allow a student to submit, I know that it, from my experience, typical model is if instructors want to have a power to do something, we want to give them that ability. So this seemed like kind of restrictive. Um, so uh, we actually uh, had one question that we made a decision on, so I yeah. would be happy to share that with you guys. It may not be what you guys were looking for, but there is a case where a student has not submitted. So currently, if a student has not submitted, it won't allow um, an instructor to allow a resubmit because it's not really a resubmit. But through the, the testing that we've done, um, as far as uh, user experience goes, faculty don't see it that way. They, they think that they should be allowed to say, even if a student hasn't submitted, if I'm giving them a resubmit past the due date, it should still allow them to submit it. So that we've made it so that an instructor can give a resubmit to a student past the due date who has not originally submitted that. So that might right. be something that might not work at some local institutions, depending on your policies. So I'm curious if uh, other institutions, you know, people on the call, um, how you feel about that. The instructor can still change the submit or accept until date. Um, I'm not sh sure if that's addressing a problem that's not really there. Well, except the accept until date would allow it for, for all the students uh, taking the assignment versus targeting specific students they want to extend, right? 
Well, if they were only allowed, well, yeah. If they were only allowed one submission, it doesn't matter what the accept until date is once they've submitted. Or two submissions, whatever. Overthinking. Um, Adam writes, my instructors have thought that allowing resubmission is for an exception for a single student, regardless of other settings. A Adam, our uh, testing confirms that as well. That's what our folks have said to you. And Louisa writes hours two, and that's from Marist. And Adam it's writes. It's good to see that uh, our decision process was right on this. It's nice to see consensus. Thank you. Yeah, it's especially helpful in terms of bringing it into trunk to know that that's how the community is expecting it to behave. Okay, cool. So we'll move on. If anyone has few, uh, further comments, uh, feel free to throw them in the chat or we can come back to it. But I think now, Jerry, uh, since uh, um, and we're ready for you to present on your e-learning fellows program. Awesome. Let me pull that up here. Is uh, everyone able to see the slides there? Hopefully it's not just me. All right. So uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jerry Timbrook at the University of Dayton, and I'm going to talk today about our e-learning fellows program. So um, I'll start out by saying that I think one of the biggest mistakes that we made was calling it the e-learning fellows program because uh, somebody heard that and they said, oh, we can just abbreviate it uh, ELF, and that uh, has stuck the entire program. We've been running it for four years, and I just I, I really wish that we had come up with a slightly better name so it wouldn't get reduced to ELF, but that's what it is. Um, so our e-learning fellows program. So in short, this program is a multi-semester faculty development program. And what we try to do is help faculty take a face-to-face -face course and transition that to a fully online environment. And in some cases, even a hybrid or flipped classroom environment. So it's, it's a pretty intensive, very long faculty development program. And at the end, Every faculty member that's a part of the program produces a fully online course that meets best standards for practice, uh, best standards for quality and things like that. Um, I have a lot of uh, resources from this talk today. Uh, if you go to tinyurl slash elearningfellows, that'll take you to a Google Drive uh, folder that I've set up. And a lot of the handouts that we give during our eLearning Fellows program are available there. But if there's something that you don't see there that you would like to have, feel free to shoot me an email and I will go ahead and upload it to that folder. So hold on to that tiny URL. I have it again at the end of the presentation, but that's where uh, all the resources will be. So just um, a little bit of context. Uh, the University of Dayton is in Ohio. We've got uh, 8,000 undergrad, 3,000 grad. And um, our instance of Sakai is called Isidore. 95% of our students use it and 80% of our faculty use it. 75% of the courses that we have in the academic catalog are supported, um, not necessarily entirely online, but at least supported by Isidore. So most people know and use Isidore on our campus, which is awesome for us. And our team, we've got five members, one assistant director, three e-learning specialists, and two web developers. It's also important to note that we've implemented this program without any formal instructional designers. Um, and also uh, two of us are adjunct faculty. So uh, that's me in the back there with the beard. And uh, I'm an adjunct for the psychology department. And Leah here, in addition to being an e-learning specialist, is also um, an adjunct for the Department of Education here. So uh, why would we go through this in the first place? Well, um, organizationally, from kind of the top down, UD was ready to commit to a stronger presence in online education. And I'm sure a lot of your institutions are starting to get to the exact same place. And additionally, we as an e-learning team are always looking for new ways to help faculty with online pedagogy, new ways to reach them and to kind of uh, tell them what best practices are. Because uh, a long time ago, I would say five or six years ago, what we saw a lot of was uh, this. So if you're looking at a fully online course as a student, you might see a resources tool full of PowerPoint slides, unnarrated, and then inside of the syllabus file, it might just say, read the book, review these PowerPoints, and submit three papers, and that's the entirety of an online course. 
And for us, that's, that's not <laughs> what we want representing our university as a fully online course. So the goals of this program were to create a professional development program that would educate participants on best practices for course creation and delivery. So we folded both of those into the program. And we also wanted to make sure that a big portion of this was to support and motivate our participants as they transition that face-to-face -face course to an online environment. Um, our key areas of focus as we went through this program, everything was quality based on industry standards. So we'll get into what we used as a quality rubric uh, towards the end. Um, all of the pedagogy that we talked about was based in research. Um, so whether it's from academic journals or um, peer reviewed books, that sort of thing. We also focused on the role of online faculty in an online course. So in both design and delivery, what's your role? Uh, helping faculty build an online learning community. So community of inquiry, that sort of thing. We had a big emphasis on aligning learning outcomes, learning materials, and assessments, and making sure that those all gridded out appropriately. And also implementing um, accessible and universal design, and making sure that these courses that faculty created were sustainable, meaning that um, when they moved from one semester to the next, they didn't have to do a lot of housekeeping to get it ready for the next semester. They could put a lot of work in up front, and then it's something that could go um, without needing too much work. So here are the gritty details of the program. Um, so we have 12 to 15 faculty that are selected each year to participate in the ELF program. For the first two years, um, deans and chairs from across campus nominated folks, and we pulled from um, a pool of nominations. And we found that we were starting to get way too many applicants after the first two years, so we switched to an application process. So although chairs and deans still had to approve people who were interested because, you know, it's going to be a big commitment, we wanted to make sure that chairs were on board with their faculty spending that much time with us. Um, we also had them complete an application to show us what they had done um, in the past as far as online learning and what their interest was in transitioning this particular course. So when we select faculty, um, we have a huge focus on diversity. We want a variety of departments, making sure everybody is represented. We get both graduate and undergraduate courses. We take people who have experience with Sakai and people who don't have any experience with Sakai. We'll take hybrid and fully online instructors. We also took on major curricular differences. Um, so the law school traditionally is completely separate from the rest of the university, but we invited them to come as well, even though they work on an entirely different academic calendar. Um, and we accepted a variety of job uh, standing, so full associate, assistant professors, as well as lecturers. So we, we wanted a, a big, diverse group of people um, to really help out that cohort feeling. So each faculty member was assigned a specific course, and this is typically determined by the dean or the department chair um, in an effort to help it meet a strategic goal of the department. So as an example, um, we currently have um, a faculty member who's taking an intro theater course and transitioning that online. And what she's going to be able to do is hand that course off to a couple of adjuncts and she's going to oversee it. But it was a strategic goal of that department to transition this um, intro course fully online. So it was something that was she was a faculty member that was selected because she knows the content very well. And it was a class that was selected because it met a goal the department had. And we do have the expectation that um, after completing the program, they are going to teach this online within a year. So that's a promise we like to get from the department chair. So at the very beginning, we made it very clear to participants that they're going to be committing a minimum of 100 hours of work to us over two semesters, which I know sounds really, really daunting and might make people run away screaming. Um, but we, they were compensated for their participation. Um, around $3,000, and when they finished, they were given an assertion of completion for their promotion and tenure file. And uh, I see Louisa in the chat is bulking at 100 hours, and if you think about it, uh, um, if you really are training someone on the learning management system, training them on pedi training, training. Can, can you guys hear me okay? Um. I was hearing you, and then just that last thing you said was uh, add a little echo. You might, but uh, up to then it was very clear for me. How about, How about now? now? Ooh. Yeah, still echoey. Test, test, test. How, How about, about now? now?
Can you guys hear me? Okay, now I do. Is there still an echo? Not too bad. Okay, I'm not for sure what happened. The uh, audio wizard just popped up. But uh, I'm going to keep going here. So, um... The, uh... Oh my gosh, I'm hearing myself. Hold on one second. Test, test, test. How about, How about now? now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to call in. in. Yeah, there is a call in uh, option. Um, if you need that, it's towards the top of the chat. I can repaste it here. Guys, can you hear me better? Uh, maybe uh, do you still have your microphone on? No, it's like you're muted on. No, I mean, does someone else have there? Oh, um, go ahead and talk again, and we watch the panel and see where if the deck might be reflecting off somebody else. But most people look like they're muted. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk. Can you guys hear me at all? My, my, my computer's, computer's completely, completely muted, so it's not me. I'll turn off. I'll mute myself, and let's see if that helps. Okay. How about, How about now? Is this any better? When you said, was it any better, just that last sentence sounded better. I'm going to pop out of the room and come back in and see if that helps. That sounds good. Ah, darn, we lost him. All right, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Was that a yes, Neil? Yes, that's a yes. I have no idea what was going on there. Let me pop back into the room. And I'll have to give you um, the moderator permissions again. Are you guys still there? Yeah. All still right. Here. I don't know if you have to re-upload your slides. Are there? No, nope, we're right here. So my apologies for that, guys. So um, back to Luis's comment about um, 100 hours being a lot. So uh, again, folks were compensated for their participation. And this um, funding came from the university's uh, graduate program. It, it's kind of a, a deal that they had that if, if we created these courses um, and they, the faculty members got compensation, the course materials became jointly owned by both the university and the faculty. So the university could hand off um, their course later down the line to um, have someone else teach it if they needed to. But also, if the faculty member decided to leave, they could also take the course material with them and teach it. So it was shared intellectual property. And then, again, they were also given an assertion of completion for their promotion and tenure file. So that definitely helped a lot of folks out as far as professional development goes. So to date, we've had four cohorts, um, which means we've had 53 faculty. They've produced 53 online courses, and they've represented 27 different departments. So we've had um, a really great showing over the past couple of years. So our formal program is four months long. 
And the focus here um, is the e-learning staff teaching the faculty to build and facilitate the online courses. And that's typically in the spring semester. And then after that, they have a development period of three months where they spend time without a formal program finishing up their courses. They still have meetings um, with us as e-learning staff individually, but we don't come together as a cohort during that development period. So typically, we spend the fall planning out um, what we're going to be doing for the next cohort. And in the spring, that's when we actually start delivering that content. And then finally, the summer is where the folks are really spending a lot of time developing their content, transitioning online. So as a part of our formal program, we have eight session meetings with a kickoff meeting, so we really don't count that one. That kickoff meeting happens in the fall semester. Um, it's at the end, typically right before Christmas break. And we all just kind of get together and discuss what's going on. And I'm going to go into some brief detail on each of these eight sessions. And if anyone is interested on um, the really in-depth detail, feel free to give me a call, and I'd be happy to send you the slides from those sessions or have a conversation with you about them. We, we could spend a ton of time talking about that um, individually. So. Uh, all sessions were held on Wednesdays from 3 to 5 p.m., so that was something that all faculty could commit to based on their course load, and we scheduled around um, academic senate meetings and things like that. Activities that we did in these formal sessions included lecture, hands-on stuff, group activities, discussion, review of research on pedagogy, and we also had an online session that was hosted through Blackboard Collaborate, and that was also recorded in case anyone missed it. During our kickoff meeting, we made sure to give them a catered lunch, our best foot forward there. We had a meet and greet with all the members of the cohort and e-learning team just so they could see who they were going to be working with, both in their cohort and as a member of their support team. We uh, had our director come in and set expectations for the program to, again, reiterate that it's a lot of work to become your own kind of instructional designer for a course and transition material from a face-to-face -face class to an online environment. We answered any questions that uh, they might have, and we handed out a goodie bag, which I'll tell you the details of here in just one second, and then we assigned um, their first homework from the goodie bag. So the goodie bag included um, a license to snag it, so that's what we encourage faculty members to um, do lecture recording with. We gave them a webcam, a USB headset, and two books, Smith's Conquering the Content, and the Botcher Conrad Online Teaching Survival Guide. So a lot of the readings that we did during the program came from those two books. The reason that we gave them the pieces of technology, um, the webcam and the headset especially, was so that we could standardize training and overcome any hurdles that they might have. So if they were running into a problem on the Mac, we would know, okay, for this headset on this Mac, we wouldn't have to go and research eight different headsets while we were trying to help folks out. So all of this together has been a real big boon for us. In our first session, Intro to Teaching Online, uh, we make sure that we start off with the end in mind. So we like to show participants some course sites that have been completed by program graduates, and then we start talking to them about the concept of backwards course design. Uh, we also go through some basic vocab, so what's the difference between synchronous and asynchronous, um, what's a learning management system, just so we all have a common language when we're talking about things. And then we have um, kind of a discussion about motivation. So why would the University of Dayton want to encourage online classes? Why would a faculty member want to teach an online class? Why would a student want to take an online class? And then finally, we ask them to drop off their syllabus onto Sakai from the class that they're going to be transitioning, just as it is the last time they taught it. That's all we were looking for. And that enabled the e-learning team to see where their course is at the start of the program. So our second session, uh, starting your course off right, we did what's called a welcome letter activity. So what we did was we gave um, everyone in the room an example welcome letter. And it was what most of them thought were a pretty good welcome letter to the course. So, you know, the email that you would send out a couple of weeks before the course starts to, to intro yourself as an instructor and the nature of the online course. And we asked them to come up with things that were wrong with it. And then what we showed faculty is there were about 15 to 20 things that were wrong with this welcome letter. So then we handed a second version out that had additions of what could have made that welcome letter better. We also had a conversation about the difference between a face-to-face -face syllabus and an online syllabus. So we gave them a syllabus that had highlighted differences between a face-to-face -face and an online syllabus so that they would know to include things like time zone. That's important for an online class, things like that. 
And then we also had um, an introductory module activity and discussion. So we had faculty um, hop onto their laptops, and then we had created through Sakai a couple of different uh, lessons pages with introductory modules that they could navigate through and get a taste for what that might look like. And then their homework for that session was to take the syllabus that they dropped off during the last session and translate that to an online syllabus. So I would say that our third session tends to be um, the best session because it's, it's also the most important, but it, it takes a little bit for faculty to wrap their head around because that's on chunking. So we, we try to get faculty to transition their thought process about a course from days. So on Tuesday, I'm going to lecture about this. A lot of them get stuck in that. So we transition their thinking from days to modules. And we have this course planning guide, which is available um, on that Google Drive, that we give them where they say, okay, think about the content that you're going to do in the first module of your course. What are your learning objectives? What kind of readings and assessments do you want them to do? What activities are going to happen there? And typically, we have to have individual meetings with each of um, the faculty at this point because, like I said, they, they really do have some trouble understanding how to take all of this material and create discrete chunks based on that. But once we get them past that point, they, they have a better understanding of the online environment and what that's going to look like. So we found that this course planning guide really helps them out, and this is also the homework that we assign for that session. Um, in addition to chunking, we also talked about accessible course design, ADA, and things like that during that session. And then we talked about um, learning objectives. So we give a little bit of lecture on Bloom's taxonomy, and we also have an activity on course and module alignment. So what we do is we give them uh, an example of different learning objectives from a fake course, and we have them make sure that all of the activities relate to the course and the module learning objectives. And then we have them go through and create their own learning objectives for the first module and make sure that they have their course mod module learning objectives done. And then make sure that all of those align out, that all of the activities and the readings that they have speak to those as well. So that's another true component of the success of this is when all of those things align to the learning objectives. So um, our fourth session is on engaging online students, and appropriately that is a session that's fully online. So we've met in person previously, but this is our um, online meeting. So we did that through Blackboard Collaborate. And we kind of go through a discussion and the difference between content delivery and content facilitation. So what I showed you, that example at the beginning of people putting PowerPoints into the resources tool and just leaving them there for students to find, that's just delivery. And there's a good quote that says, you know, yes, faculty are responsible for the delivery of content, but if that's all they do, they're no different than a UPS driver. So they have to actually facilitate that as well. And we give them a lot of examples of engaging activities, engaging online assignments, um, engaging lecture videos, what do you do during office hours, what are some different technology tools that you can use to facilitate online engagement. And then we have kind of an activity brainstorm where we have them come up with uh, some activities for the course that they're um, doing face-to-face. -face. So we all kind of workshop those together in that online session. Um, and uh, we try to get them over the, uh, a lot of them are afraid to be on camera for the first time. So I, I kind of use a self-deprecating example. That's me and that picture there. Some of the feedback that I, I'm the one, that's this one, not that guy. That's a, a professor of ours in office hours in his office. But um, when I was creating online lecture videos for my course, I got feedback from my students that said that I wink too much, and I thought they were crazy until I went back and saw that maybe, <laughs> maybe I winked five times per video. So that's something that I um, have definitely worked on a little bit, but they thought it was funny um, and it made them a little bit less self-conscious about being on camera to know, yes, everybody's going to make mistakes. Even people who do this professionally still have a little bit of trouble with uh, every little detail of it. So in our fifth session, um, we focus on building online community, and that's a watchword for the University of Dayton. Um, they, they say that uh, community is one of the pillars of learning here. Um, we we're a Marianist institution, and the definition of a Marianist institution is learning in community. So we make sure to really focus on how do you transition that sense of community that you cultivate in a face-to-face -face class to an online environment. So we help them understand how to structure, foster, grade, and facilitate quality online discussion. So how do you really get that sense of community online? And then once that's done, we um, have the cohort show us and tell us about what they've been working on. So that way um, they can get some ideas from each other when they see something neat that one faculty member in a different department is doing. And if one or two of the folks in our cohort are falling behind, they can see all of the work that the other faculty members have done, and that motivates them to move a little more at that point. 
in our sixth session, um, right before that, as homework, uh, we did a flip classroom version of FERPA and HIPAA. So we did an online lecture with a quiz after it. So we had a quick discussion of what they covered in the online lecture. And uh, if they had any questions about it, they could ask um, in person. But it was also just to give them a little bit of an idea of what a flipped classroom looks like, um, because a lot of faculty members haven't heard of that before. So we look at different types of assessments. Um, we have a group activity on turnaround time. And that's uh, really interesting, because they, a lot of our faculty call that tat here like a tattoo, so that's kind of become part of our vernacular now, too. Whenever we talk about turnaround time, we always think of uh, a tattoo. Um, we also talk about the importance of providing timely and quality feedback. And we had one of our student workers make a little radio drama about their frustration with not getting um, information back on paper one before paper two and the final or midterm exams were due. So if anybody's interested in that, you can go and hear our kind of chintzy radio drama out there. And uh, we also give them some examples of feedback options in an online environment. So you can kind of vary how you give feedback. You don't have to just type good job exclamation point. You can use Snagit to actually go through a person's paper and give them some feedback. Or you could use an MP3 recorder to give some audio feedback as you're going through a paper. And we also talk about the importance of a midterm instructional diagnostic. So feedback not just from the faculty to the students, but halfway through the course, getting feedback from the students to the faculty member. So that way, if they need to do any course correcting during the online course, they can do that. We focus um, on the concept of quality assurance in session seven. So we give them a reading on quality, and then they go through, do that on their own, and then we come back together and have a discussion about it. We go through a web tour of nosignificantdifference.org. So if you aren't familiar with that, it's a website that's a collection of scholarly journal articles saying that um, for a variety of different metrics, um, there's no significant difference in quality between online learning and face-to-face -face learning. We give them kind of an overview of industry quality metrics. So quality matters, there's the uh, CSU rubric, and also we talk about our own rubric, which I'll mention here in a little bit. And then we have a guest speaker, which we always ask a person from the previous cohort to come in and talk about their experiences delivering the course that they created. Because at this point at session seven, faculty are starting to see, OK, I understand how to make all of this, but what do I really do to ensure quality when I'm delivering it? So we like to have that outside faculty perspective for them as well. And then in our very last formal session, we have um, kind of a finishing touches. So we have a discussion of getting a course ready for delivery, and then what a delivery, what delivery of an online course actually looks like, the different phases. Um, and then we have what we call a synthesis activity. So I grabbed a whole bunch of feedback from different um, student feedback surveys that faculty have shared with us over the years. And we've showed that feedback individually, so piece by piece. If a student made a comment, well, I seem, we always felt like we were rushed in the modules. Um, what, we would ask the faculty what they could do to fix that problem. So they would use all of the information that they've gathered from all of our previous sessions to try to provide suggestions to um, this fake professor on what they could do to fix their online course. So it was a little bit of using everything they've learned. We had a little program reflection. What have you learned uh, in general? What do you think we could change in future cohorts? And then we have a final show and tell where faculty show each other where they are at that point in time. So uh, we have our sessions every other week. So session one would have been this Wednesday. And then session two would have been two weeks after that. In between these formal sessions, we have what we call lab hours. So these are optional sessions that if faculty want to come and get training on the button clicks of Sakai, so if they needed help on how do you actually use the lessons tool, how do you upload a syllabus, those sorts of things, we didn't have to use our formal session time because, again, we did have people of varying LMS experience. So that way we could kind of pull those out and help them in between. So we already knew that they had that Wednesday at from 3 to 5 available, so we knew that they would be able to come if they needed that help. And we, would, we had about 50% attendance at any given session, so about half of our cohort would show up. We had for, a formal program for the first two lab sessions, so we knew that we were going to cover Sakai basics in the first one, and then a little bit of advanced Sakai in the second one. And then we had open sessions, so it was basically just like a coffee shop. We provided coffee to the faculty. They could come in, and they had two hours on their schedule that they could just work on transitioning their course online, and the e-learning staff would just be sitting there available if they had any questions. So it were, those were our lab hours.
So it, um, when we talk about the delivery of this program, we really put the faculty in the student role. So they used Sakai as a student. They completed homework, uploaded that to Sakai. They received feedback on their work via Sakai. So that way, they could see what the student experience is like in an online environment, and also so they can get an idea of what maybe frustrates them as a student, so they can avoid the, those same things when they become the faculty in their own courses. So the e-learning team were the instructors, and we treated the program as a model for site structure. So um, we had a Sakai page, um, the e-learning fellows website, and we used the lessons tool. We had Samago in there. We also made sure to use the forums to solicit feedback, and we had our online sessions that happened through the Collaborate Classroom Bridge. So we used that website um, in a model way to show them what that should look like. And whenever we assigned them homework, we made sure to implement all of those best practices that we were talking about. So if we gave them a homework, we would give them text instructions, but we would also record a video giving them instructions just to show them diversity um, in how you present things, and then give them different prompts in different ways. Sometimes it was a video recording, sometimes it was an audio recording. We tried a couple of different things. Um, so we did structure out everything in the lessons tool. Um, so they could go to the lessons tool and get to all of the other components of the course, the assignments tool and San Diego. They didn't have to go to the individual tools, but they could if they wanted to. So our expectations for the faculty um, were that they had to attend. Um, so they had to come to at least six of the eight sessions and complete all of the assigned homework. There was participation in community. So because this was a cohort, we expected them to come and actively participate in our sessions. And uh, they also had check-in points. So they submitted coursework at two different check-in points throughout the program, and then they had a final course review uh, by August 15th. So uh, Terry has a question here. How did they experience uh, the UD or accessibility features? Terry, do you want to hop on the mic and say a little more about that? I was wondering if, um, if they were able to like try out their course that you were modeling for them, like with a screen reader or something like that, so that they would experience the kinds of things that student experiences that has those special needs. Um, I'm just kind of becoming more and more aware of the capabilities and that kind of thing there. And I'm not you know, trying to make the faculty more aware of those kinds of things as well. And when you were talking about experiencing the course as a student, I wondered if they had the opportunity to experience the course as a student who had these special needs. That's a great question, Terry. And yes, that's actually something that we did. So. Um, we did a demonstration of the basics, what uh, alt text tags look like. Um, we showed them some differences in um, text uh, contrast so that they could understand for people who have um, difficulty seeing or if someone's colorblind. But we also, our Office of Learning Resources has on retainer um, as an employee a student who is blind and actually uses um, a screen reader to access our instance of Sakai. And uh, they kind of get the cohort members get an idea of how it actually reads that out and how that's different from how we read a web page. And we use that screen reading session to help the program participants understand the concept uh, and importance of headers. So when they use the text box in the lessons tool to make sure that they select heading one, because the, the blind student shows, that's how they actually navigate through the page. And once they see that, at first they could say, oh, do I really have to do this? But once they see that that's how um, a blind student navigates the page, it completely changes their perspective on it. So that, that's such a great example. Thank you for bringing that up, Terry. So um, as I mentioned before, we did have uh, two checkpoints as well as a final turn in. So in early March, right before session four, we had checkpoint one. So the faculty had to have their welcome letter, syllabus, intro module and a first module done entirely for us. And then uh, checkpoint two was in early May, right before session eight. Faculty needed to have half of their modules completed. So again, because faculty chunk things in different ways, some faculty might have had 30 modules, some faculty might have had only six modules. However many modules they had, they had to have half of them completely finished. And then how, that second checkpoint had a small stipend associated with it, so a portion um, was assigned there. That way it motivated them to get that done by the second checkpoint. And then the rest of the stipend came into play in the middle of August, around the 15th, when they turn in their entire course. 
So um, our rubric is kind of a combination of a couple of different quality rubrics that are out there. Uh, most of it comes from Quality Matters. We're a participating institution with them. But there are some local things that we needed to add and tweak to make sure that we got a sense of um, our university's learning strategy in there. So we have that rubric uh, available in the, the Google Drive folder. So if you're interested in what that is, feel free to take a peek at that. But whenever we looked at one of these check-in points, we always graded it against the rubric. So that way, if faculty didn't pass for some reason, they knew exactly why it was, but at the same time, faculty knew exactly what they had to do in order to pass muster for that particular check-in. So um, again, the compensation was around $3,000, $150 per participant for course materials and educational technology, so that's the goodie bag. There was a $250 stipend for completing that uh, second check-in, and then the final stipend came at the very, very end. So if you're looking for a total number on that uh, for about 12 fellows a year, you're looking at around 41,000. And again, like I mentioned before, this was uh, funded by our associate provost and uh, faculty and our university jointly own the intellectual property rights. So what's some of the feedback that we have gotten from our faculty on this program? We make sure to capture data um, at three different points. So this graph shows you for our different first three cohorts. How knowledgeable are you about developing an online course? So our first cohort, they were pretty low, and you can see gradual growth over time for the first two cohorts. A funny thing happened for our third cohort. If you remember, um, we mentioned that we moved from a nomination process by chairs to an application process, and as a part of that application process, people had to put their experience with online teaching so uh, as we found out through asking the faculty, they came into the course, yeah, um, Sawa, this is a self-assessment. Thank you, I forgot to mention that. They completed a, a quick questionnaire at three different points during the program. So the faculty came into our program thinking that they knew a lot more than they actually did. And this is all based on what they said after the fact in the third cohort, because they felt they completed this application, they had mentioned all of their accomplishments in online learning, and they were selected because of their accomplishments in online learning. So that they realized when they hit this number, there really wasn't a whole lot for them to grow, but they, they didn't really realize what they didn't know. So there's no significant difference between these two bars right here. They stayed approximately the same between the mid and post. And again, that was an artifact of them having thought that they knew more than they did coming in, or else you would have seen probably something more similar to the 2012-2013 cohort. And we also asked them about knowledgeable about delivering an online course, and you can see the exact same thing, gradual growth, and then for our third cohort, they thought that they were a little bit better than they actually were coming into the program. So some other questions that we asked. Um, the, the question that we always get is, um, is 100 hours really worth it? And in the middle of it, I think faculty would tell you that they've wanted to pull their hair out sometimes. But at the end, every single faculty member, regardless of how um, nervous they were about online learning in the first place, have always come out saying that this is one of the best experiences that they've had. They always think that they put in a good amount of work, and we, we tend to agree with that. Um, and we, we hope that we cultivated a place where they could share their thoughts and fears with online learning. So all of these kind of match up with what our goals were for the program. Um, anecdotally, faculty told us that uh, the things that they liked the most were learning in community, being able to not only learn but master um, Sakai. They were really happy about learning about best practices and being forced to stay on schedule with those check-ins because um, I'm sure as a lot of you know it's hard to keep faculty on board and then creating that student instructor relationship and having and using that ELF rubric. And so actually Neil is asking me to wrap up and I think I only have one more slide here. Um, the things that have worked for us uh, the ELF rubric, having faculty in uh, smaller teams, the check-in points, having that combination of a formal program and development time and using money as a carrot. And some unplanned positive outcomes, things that weren't a part of our goal. Um, faculty have told us that they've implemented a lot of the learning objective alignment in their face-to-face -face courses that they've learned. So they've used that to improve their face-to-face -face courses. And we've also had what we call the Pied Piper effect. So positive word of mouth from cohort members has led to more people coming to our department for things. And also program graduates act as a departmental expert on online learning. So whenever they have their department meetings, that person typically will come in and speak about online learning. Or if a person in the department has a question about Sakai, they always know exactly who to go to. 
And it's also helped us create relationships with cohort members. So like I said, these 50-some individuals are now people that we know personally. So that's been great. Again, um, all of these uh, documents are available on our eLearning Fellows site. And if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. So uh, again, sorry about that audio problem earlier. And uh, Neil, thank you very much for uh, letting me finish up here. Hi, Jerry. Yeah, thanks a lot. I realized there was some technical issues. Um, I suspect there would be uh, interest in further discussion. I don't know if folks want to just contact you offline or if you want to take, uh, you know, I guess we're not meeting the next couple of weeks. I don't know, you know, if there'll be continuity and coming back to ask for questions. So, uh, Sure. So uh, Terry just asked for my email in the chat here, and it is jtimbrook1 at udayton.edu. Cool. So that might be the best way. It's kind of a shame because it would be nice to, you know, have some time to, um, you know, get questions answered right now while it's fresh in people's minds. And maybe giving them time to reflect is, uh, is good, too. So thanks for putting up with those technical, um, you know, glitches and, and uh, you know, Oh, no problem. In the presentation, yeah. Thank you. Um, and of course, we have it recorded, so that that's really cool. Um, so the and I'll get that published, um, you know, as soon as I can, uh, probably you know by early next week, maybe by the end of this week. Um, so to wrap up, uh, to reminder, we have uh, two sessions. The next two sessions are canceled, and they're canceled uh, intentionally to give folks time. They're assuming that a lot of folks, at least in North America. Um, have back to school activities they need to attend to. And so, you know, freeing up a couple of those hours. Um, then we have a uh, lessons discussion on September 2nd, a UX testing update on September 9th. I was going to do a presentation on QA on September 16th. I haven't figured out exactly um, how I want to structure that yet. Um, Workwire would had to get canceled uh, last week as going to be the 23rd. I remember there was a big blue button was going to be rescheduled, so I need to go check on that. I thought I had rescheduled them. Um, let me see if I can find that. It's definitely not on our radar, so I might have dropped the ball on that because the big blue button folks, the uh, I'm sorry, Blindside Networks definitely indicated an interest because they missed their session and they wanted to make that up, and I think there's interest in that. So I'll see if I can get that scheduled. Um, I, I'm sorry about that. And then uh, we had some ideas for future topics. We just have a few weeks that are open before, or several weeks that are open before the Sakai Virtual Conference. I don't know if there's any. And we had some topics that um, we thought we might want to cover, like you know, brainstorming a lessons wish list for Chuck Hedrick. We might want to see how the column stuff comes out first. Uh, leap, whether we're going to have a phase two or not, or, or you know, that kind of uh, goes alongside with what Chuck Hedrick is doing. Um, so I'm not sure. Louisa and I can talk about that offline and, and maybe with others and, and figure that out. Um, some interest in Sakai podcasts and polls. I don't know what that's about, but apparently need volunteers to do that presentation. I guess there was some interest in those tools. Uh, LTI demos, now comment demo, and a documentation group update. So uh, last couple of minutes, just curious if anyone wants to can refresh our memory on the podcasts and polls idea or has ideas for other things they would either like to present themselves or uh, would love to see this group discuss. Uh, and as you can see from today, it doesn't have to be Sakai specific. It can also be teaching and learning. It could be general principles, planning, uh, different programs that you have. Yeah, any thoughts, any things that you, you know, that are uh, things that you would particularly like to see or presentations you'd be willing to do from, from your institution, the kinds of things that you're working on? No, no ideas at the moment. Okay. Um, okay. Well, that's that's fine if you think of anything. Yeah, it could be homework for for you. If you, you know, again, if you want to do anything that's either Sakai 
related or not Sakai related, teaching and learning related, or Aperio tools related, or if you have suggestions for the planners of these sessions, which is myself and Trisha and Matthew, and maybe we can go out and try and find some people willing to do some presentations. So um, the plans for the virtual conference, those are underway, Terry. Uh, you might have seen a call for proposals. So we're, uh, the team is looking for proposals on presentations. Um, uh, and there's um, planning is, is underway. I don't know if you have a specific question about that. And then I need to kind of wrap up and, yeah, I'm here. Do you not hear me? Hello? Hello? I can hear you now. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, so anyway, yeah, we, maybe we can get a Sakai. Hello? Okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on technically there, but uh, if any of you have questions, I mean, that may be a possibility is to do a pitch for, yeah, audio was kind of weird today, Jerry. If anyone, maybe if you want us to do a pitch a little bit, maybe Wilma and I, we could think about doing a pitch for a uh, future one as the Sakai in September about the Sakai VC, and um, that might be a cool thing. I don't know if that would take a full presentation, but it might be a minute or two. So um, so I'm going to end the recording, and thank you all, and I'll uh, we'll see you in a few weeks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again, Jerry. And thank you, Dayton. I mean, you guys are doing a lot of, lot of good work. and ending recording.